But I think a good example for Borges is the first of his great ficciones from 1939, the Pierre Menard, mm -hmm. author of the Quixote. Very interesting work because it's often read purely as metafiction. Oh, this is a work about a fantasy of works, a kind of detective story, you know, who was Pierre Menard, what did he really write, right. and what is he doing rewriting this great Don Quixote classic. And a lot of the discussion of that story goes to sort of elaborate semi-fake list of works and then the rewriting of Quixote. But I'm very interested also in the opening paragraph, which is full of this kind of strange infighting. It begins, it's also quite interesting, it's a la obra visible, the visible of, and Borges had just had an accident to his head that was going to bring on blindness, which mm -hmm. his father had already had. Right. So this question of visibility, invisibility is personally fraught. And he did. And does go blind. He does go blind. Right, and so the exactly. blind librarian becomes yes. an interesting issue. And this is published in this magazine, Sur, in Spanish, but it looks as though it is a translation of a French work. Mm -hmm. so it's a, a pseudo-translation, mm -hmm. much like Candide is a pseudo-translation <laughs> from German. Mm -hmm. This is a pseudo-translation mm -hmm. from French. So he's doing a Voltaire to Voltaire, right. you could say. Right. But this language is very strange. So this visible oeuvre of this novelist can be easily and briefly enumerated. You know, and if you believe that, I have a bridge to say in Brooklyn. Unpardonable, therefore, the omissions and additions perpetrated by Madame Henri Bachelier in a deceitful catalog that a certain newspaper, whose Protestant leanings are surely no secret, has been so inconsiderate as to inflict upon that newspaper's deplorable readers, few and Calvinist, if not Masonic and circumcised, though they be. I mean, as true friends, it goes on like this. And, you know, this is all very, very peculiar. But I think what it is is a kind of translation of the very severe cultural politics going on in Buenos Aires in the 1930s. So there's no immediate hint of this. It's mm -hmm. a very calm, scholarly thing. But just underneath are these seething rivalries. And what you have is what was called the infamous decade, starting in 1930. One coup after another, one near disaster after another. You have communists fighting anarchists, fighting outright fascists. Mm -hmm. A very few liberals caught somewhere in the middle of all of this, not very many of them. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you see Borges figuring out in this story is precisely how to universalize his local problems, the problems of his culture, by translating them up. Mm -hmm. This process of translation, translatio, yeah. mm -hmm. or really bringing it upwards rather than across, up to the level of fiction, the metafiction. Right. Now we'll have all the racial, political, cultural anxieties and tensions, as well as the personal one, blindness and sight that that's also really being inscribed in his body at that mm -hmm. time. That's really interesting. So he takes all these irreconcilable tensions and translates them into this crazy speculation that here was this much later French author who rewrote word for word Don Quixote. That's right. And the speculation what it would mean for this very different and much later person to somehow produce word for word the same work that would mm -hmm. not remain the same if written by this other That's right. Frenchman. And this imaginary Frenchman is usually thought of as a pure fiction, a symbolist poet. It's quite interesting because he lives in Nîmes, this provincial city in south of France. So Borges, who's writing at the center of the periphery, takes a character who's at the periphery of the center. Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, the same month in which he's publishing this story, in Sur, an actual Pierre Menard is publishing a psychological analysis of Lautre Aumont, who was a Uruguayan-born French poet. So again, this migration back and mm -hmm. forth. So there's a real Pierre Menard who's analyzing the insect-like handwriting of Lautre Aumont, which is rather like the insect-like handwriting of Pierre Menard. Borges has to have seen this story in manuscript because they're always trading back and forth among these little magazines. Yes, it's interesting. This speculation of this late 19th century Frenchman rewriting Cervantes' Don Quixote, there's also something very tongue-in-cheek. Like there's this one moment where he talks about this second mm -hmm. writing of Don Quixote, and he says, the text of Cervantes and that of Menard are verbally identical. After all, Menard has rewritten in this speculation the entirety of Don Quixote word for word, but the second is almost infinitely richer. What do you make <laughs> of this sentence? <laughs> Well, it's a wonderful kind of turning on its head the kind of fin de siècle, decadent nostalgia, oh, a sort of work of decline. Here now, this we can't invent anything new, but now we're going to make something infinitely better. And particularly intriguing with this passage, the sort of key words, you know, the truth that is a mother of history. This is mm -hmm. the passage that he takes. So he uses that as an example. He quotes it from example. Don Quixote and then re 
quote right. from the same words from right. It was a mere cliche back when yeah. Cervantes said, but now the, in the era of William James, again, the philosophy comes back in. Right. Now this is a radical historicism. So is this a joke or is that to be taken <laughs> seriously? Well, it's very interesting. It's been taken on several levels. And one of the things it makes you into, if you're Borges' ideal reader, is you become a literary detective. You have to say, right. all right, because he actually gives you, so there's all these fake sources, but actually the Quixote is a real source. He tells her, this is chapter nine of book one. And if you go back to chapter nine of book one, you find their precise precisely reinscribed ethnic and religious conflicts mm -hmm. and metafictional conflicts. So he's reinventing Cervantes as himself, avant la lettre, mm -hmm. we could say, to use an appropriate French phrase for Pierre Menard. Because what's happening at that moment, Cervantes starts out writing rather simple satire of knightly romances. Through the first eight chapters, that's what's happening. Quixote goes crazy by reading too many books, of mm -hmm. course, and tries to become a knight. An unhealthy knight habit. habit. Exactly, exactly. As a librarian, Borges would know about that. That's right, exactly. All too unhealthy habit. And then suddenly, at the end of chapter eight, he and this villain are about to have a sword fight, but they stopped in mid-blow because uh, the manuscript breaks off. And chapter nine, Cervantes says, well, I'm sorry I didn't have the rest of the manuscript. I was eager to know what happens. And he goes into the marketplace and he finds an Arabic manuscript, which turns out to be written by a Moorish historian named Sidamiti Benengeli, his name means eggplant, which is telling the real story, how it continues. So now I can see how the story ends. But the story now of this foundational work of Spanish literature is by a Moor. And of course, the Moors and the Jews had been supposed to be expelled mm -hmm. in 1492, were right. expelled. So if you're there at all, you're there as some kind of secret converso mm -hmm. still practicing. Mm -hmm. which Borges himself was accused of being descended from Portuguese conversos. And at this moment, Cervantes then says, well, now I've got the rest of the story. And of course, really, we want to know the true story, but, well, it is a Moor, and we know the Moors lie all the time. In this very passage in this chapter 9, this is from Cervantes, uh, Cervantes now. says, no story is bad provided it is truthful. Nevertheless, if any objection can be raised against the truth of this history, it can only be because its author was an Arab. For those of that nation are much inclined to lying. And since they are such bitter enemies of ours, on top of being naturalized, they're also our enemies, right? We might more readily suppose him to have fallen short of the truth than to have exaggerated. And that's my personal belief. For when he should and could have let his pen run in the indulgent eulogies of so worthy a knight, he seems to pass over in silence deliberately, thereby acting badly and with malicious intention. For historians are in honor bound to be precise, truthful, and dispassionate, so that neither interest nor fear nor ill will nor affection shall move them to swerve from the path of truth whose mother is history. The rival of time, star has the great deeds, witness to the past, example lesson of the present, warning to the future. Precisely the, the passage, line that yeah. Maynard quotes. So this lying dog of a moor has written this truth whose mother is history. Mm -hmm. And now all of it is being rewritten by this semi-imaginary Frenchman. That's right. Um, so it's this tour de force whereby instead of being the kind of provincial who's sort of imitating at a distance the foundational Spanish work, right. now it turns out that you find the Cervantes that really is the modernist, the postmodernist Cervantes. Right. Rather than the kind of man of La Mancha, you're finding this very strange metafictional character, very much bound up with debates about Semitic peoples, uh, Jews, or Arabs versus the Spaniards. And this resonates with the strange opening paragraph mm -hmm. that you referred the, these to earlier. These Masonic or circumcised readers exactly. of the magazine.